that you talked about here this morning in your committee, Mr. Chairman, and that is becoming competitive. And the other is trying to maintain a social society without reducing wages. Now, in the United States, in fact, I have the figure. We were talking about, United, uh, about uh, reduction of wages. Since 1973, these official government figures, in inflation-adjusted figures, the weekly earnings in the United States are down by 19.2%. So by adjusting w what you've done before NAFTA and before GATT is to try and compete by reducing the standard of living. Now, in the good old days, it was thought that the purpose of an economy was to create prosperity, not poverty. Mr. Henry Ford wanted to pay his wages high salaries, Mr. Chairman, not low salaries. He was proud of that. They became his customers. All of a sudden, this is a policy to reduce wages, a policy to impoverish. The same policy has been, uh, been, been applied in the United Kingdom, who are proud of the fact that salaries in the United Kingdom earnings are cheaper than elsewhere. I would be proud, Mr. Chairman, if salaries were higher than elsewhere. Earnings were higher, not lower. Insofar as France is concerned, let me give you an example, real life example. Not all this theory we've been hearing, real life. In the last 20 years in France, gross national product has grown by 80%, 80, spectacular. During that period, free trade has been progressively introduced, not GATT, just a international free trade under the old rules, the old rules of GATT prior to the Uruguay round. And during that period of growth of 80%, Mr. Chairman, unemployment has risen from 420,000 people to 5.1 million. That's equivalent to 25 million in the United States. Now, how can we be going down the right way when in a period where the economy has grown 80%, unemployment has grown from 420,000 to 5.1 million? And why has it grown? From a combination of reasons. Obviously, automation and productivity is one. But everybody's going to have that, and we're all going to have to live with that. But on top of that, it's factories that have gone offshore, French factories, and re-import the goods in a way which is preparatory to the Uruguay round. They have merely said to their labor forces, goodbye. You're too expensive. You want holidays. You want protection. We can go to Vietnam. We can go to the Philippines. We can get 47 like you who work as well, who will seek no protection, and whom we can exploit as we desire. And that has been the single biggest factor, Mr. Chairman. And that is what is going to happen throughout the developed world. It's pure common sense. How can anybody wishing to set up a new factory set it up with the same technology and the same capital, setting the same products to be sold in the same marketplace in a country in which employment costs 47 times more than the other one? Forget the theory just straight common sense and the reality of what has happened. So, when I hear this business about let's become economic, the reality is you haven't got time to and you shouldn't want to because you can improve, you can become as economic as and more economic than any other country which has similar, which is in a similar planet to you in terms of labor. But you cannot become, in, you cannot become competitive if that means reducing the earnings of your people by 80 to 90 percent. Because you're not going to improve on the other people's technology, nor on the other people's capital access. access. Now that's got to be madness. The purpose of the economy is to serve society, not the other way round. Now, the tragedy about 
all this, Mr. Chairman, is that it's going to create deep divisions in society. Very deep decisions indeed. As you were saying, sir, over the last generations, value added, which means when you take raw material and manufacture it into a product, the value that you have added has been split between capital and between labor in a way which has emerged from decades and decades of political and trade union combat. You fought elections on it, you've had strikes, you've had lockouts, and you've reached a consensus which keeps society together. Today, four billion people, most of whom are unemployed, many of them willing to work for a fraction. The whole of that labor is being added to the supply of labor. You all know the rules of law and supply. You all know what happens if four billion people are added. The result is that labor goes down brutally in value. You shatter the distribution, the sharing of the value added between capital and labor. And labor can do nothing about it, even if they organize and organize toughly, because all that has to be answered is we're going away. And insofar as the going away is concerned, I'd like you to give you some figures about, which came out in the official, I think it was no ECD report, but I've got, it, I've got the report available if you need it, Mr. Chairman. Transnational corporations today have annual sales of $4.8 trillion. They account for one-third of global output. Their volume is greater than the total international trade. The largest 100 control one-third of all foreign direct investment, largest 100. Now, how do these corporations function, Mr. Chairman? And I don't blame the chief executives. I blame us for creating a system which forces them to do this, because the chief executive has to look after his corporation and run it as profitably as he can. Whereas it is our task, Mr. Chairman, to ensure that the structures in which he operates are beneficial for our societies. And that is, it is us who are falling down, not the chief executives. And the chief executives, how do they operate? They operate by manufacturing everywhere. Like IBM was saying, they're going to one place, but they want an opportunity to move elsewhere. Hewlett Packard is in Malaysia, but wants to find even cheaper labor. And they manufacture wherever they like, and they sell where they, wherever they like. It's a basic principle of global free trade. They are outside the jurisdiction of the nation, of the patria. Their, in, their interests today are no longer the interests of the United States. And the old saying that what's good for General Motors is good for the United States is hopelessly out of date. That is no longer the case because big business has a total conflict of interest. And I can tell you that as a person who has been a big businessman. But I am a big businessman who believes that there is zero purpose in making a vast amount of quick profit if we're going to end up by destroying the stability of our societies. Now, Mr. Cantor asked, I think it was the Ambassador Cantor, who said, what's the difference? between losing jobs in industry and losing jobs in farming. Well, in losing jobs in industry, you've got to constantly deal with innovation. It's not changing society. But when you move people in from the countryside into the towns, when you move from 20, 30, 40% down to 10%, it changes not only the countryside, but the towns. It changes also the need for jobs. It creates unemployment. It creates some lack of stability. So there is a difference. Mr. Chairman, I will finish by saying that it is a mistake to judge the health of an economy by the profitability of its largest corporations. The health, and I'm for profitability and I'm for larger corporations, but the health of an economy has to be judged 
by the amount of healthy employment increase it, it generates by its general prosperity and not by social and also by social stability and I am absolutely convinced and that is why Mr. Chairman I have joined the profession, the vocation, the calling that you all have here because I feel so strongly about it that GATT will destroy all of those three things in a way which will profoundly destabilize our societies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Sir James, I appreciate very, very much. I, again, like the attendance, some of, uh, not even had questions of the first witness. Let me take my turn at the last go, last go around and uh, Senator Bro. Uh, Chairman, and thank you, Sir Goldsmith, for coming over and <clears throat> to um, our Congress to give us your benefit of your thoughts. We may enter a, an exchange program, and we'll accept your advice over here, and then we'll send Chairman Hollins over to uh, Great Britain and let him testify over there and straighten those <laughs> people out over there. He will be very willing. He <laughs> promises so. <laughs> very, very, very welcome if he comes. Let me just... Uh, <laughs> Uh, your basic premise, uh, I think, is, is concentrated on problems of GATT, making it much more easy for our industries to move where wages are the lowest because, indeed, they are a major factor on productivity and profitability and survival of industries in, in the world. Let me give you a couple, just two thoughts, and then ask you to comment on it. I mean, look at the automobile industry. I mean, Mercedes-Benz um, built a, a new plant in Alabama in this country. They didn't build it in Bangladesh. Uh, Nissan is a brand new plant that's been built in this country in Tennessee. They didn't build it in India. Toyota has a, a fine manufacturing plant in Ohio. They didn't build it in Malaysia. BMW has opened up a very fine first-class facility in the chairman state of South Carolina. They didn't build it in Somalia or Rwanda. The arguments that were made when we debated NAFTA was that because of uh, lower wages, lower health standards, lower environmental standards, um, <clears throat> and lower wages, that all of our industries were going to move if we removed all trade barriers to that country to locate because of profitability. I think that the two things I cite I'd like you to comment on because with NAFTA the early indications are to the contrary that we are increasing our exports to that country, that countries are not, companies are not relocating there despite all those uh, incentives that some would argue is the primary motivation about where a company does business. Uh, can you give me your thoughts on, on those two comments I made? Yes, absolutely, Senator. Firstly, I'd like to say that GATT is not NAFTA II. I see that it's always, always described as NAFTA II. NAFTA was a free trade area with your two neighbors, Mexico and Canada, 100 million people. GATT is a free trade area with China, free trade area with India, free trade area with Indonesia. Not 100 million people, 4 billion people. Mexico, Senator, is high labor cost compared to the people who are joining now. They will suffer from GATT. Having said that, this is not, that we haven't yet reached the period, and one must constantly look forward, constantly and not try and learn always from behind, but look, from back, look also forward. But let's look at the current. I just wanted to give you some figures. You mentioned motor car companies in Mexico. Well, I will answer what happened. Between January and May 1994, Mexico shipped 154,000 vehicles across the border to be sold in the US, while car, US car makers shipped only 17,000 vehicles to Mexico. In 1994, you mentioned new, new, new expansion, Honda announced it would build a new automobile factory in Mexico. Nissan, Volkswagen, Ford, General Motors and Car Chrysler are also expanding the Mexican-based production. So even though NAFTA is trivial, trivial compared to GATT, absolutely not in the same ballpark, I'm afraid the car factories are moving and expanding there. <clears throat> well, I appreciate your thoughts. I appreciate your strong feelings on this issue and to come all the way to Washington to express them is, uh, is appreciated. We have a difference of opinion, obviously, but um, I appreciate your... Senator, thank you. I, I, the reason why I'm here is because I believe that we face identical problems. 
We are part of the same developed world. We've grown together, you perhaps more vigorously, but nonetheless together. So we have similar problems, it's a world problem, and whereas I would never even consider making a comment on matters which concerned US domestic political matters, this is an international cooperative effort which affects us identically, and that's why I felt I could be allowed to come. I moment. appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Packwood. Mr. Chairman, let me congratulate you on the both the witnesses today and Mr. Fallows yesterday. They've been good testimony. Mr. Fallows yesterday uh, was not in the, on the identical track you're on, but not, not far off. He was basically saying countries have to watch out for their national interest, and if they're going to move all their production elsewhere, they'll end up being consumers, and eventually they'll consume nothing. They'll have no productive capacity. But then I asked him, in that case, does that mean we all kind of settle into little protective enclaves um, and export relatively little and purchase relatively little? And he almost answered yes to that. I said, what happens? He called the United States a trade sink for both the Japan surplus and Asia's surplus. And he said, if we close off the trade sink, they will have to sell more of their production domestically to their own consumers, because they can produce more than they're currently consuming. Uh, before I go on to the second question, uh, is, is his theory roughly right? Senator, no. OK. Let me, let me explain to you where I stand. And obviously, when I say, is it right, I'm giving you my view. North American free trade area and Mexico in that is not much more important than the poor areas of Europe is to are to us, such as Portugal and Greece and Sardinia and Sicily and places of that kind. You can't have total homogeneity. These markets, the North American free trade area and the European market, are colossal, Senator. They're the biggest ever known to history and by a mile. Now, why do we need big marketplaces. We need big marketplaces so as to create the right amount of competitive pressure. Competition is a tool. It's not a demigod, it's a tool. And it's a tool to force us to be competitive, to force us to innovate, to force us to supply diversity to customers. The North American free trade market is the biggest market and can supply the most effective and vigorous tool you've ever had of this kind same as we can in Europe. So this is vast. So how should these great regions, and the others are being formed. There's the Asian free trade area of the six countries in Asia being formed at the moment. There are two Latin American free trade areas being formed at the moment, Mercosur, and they're homogeneous and they're not going to cause themselves trouble. How do we deal with them? Firstly, you've got to ask yourself one or two questions. The first question is how do we help them develop? without destroying ourselves? And the answer to that is keep freedom of movement of capital. Keep freedom of movement of technology. And when... What's the second freedom of capital? Of tech, movement of technology. And when our corporations, yours in America, ours in Europe, want to go and sell in Latin America, in the, in the middle of their free trade area, let them go there, bring their capital, bring their technology, open factories, employ Latin Americans or Asians or whatever part, particular region you want, and participate as corporate citizens of those countries. But would it be a... So, so it would develop them. And it would develop them without destroying us because we wouldn't be hemorrhaging jobs. And insofar as we are concerned, that's you in the United States and us in Europe, if we had a similar policy, all those people who've moved offshore to supply us with shoes and textiles and furniture and electronics and Boeing aircraft and, and, and all the micro devices and the rest, they'd have to come straight back to the United States and they'd have to open new factories and they'd have to employ Americans and they'd have to pay, participate in every way in the active life. You would have a great retransfusion of blood instead of hemorrhaging to death as you are now. Well, I, let me ask you what you're saying. You're talking about creating the eight or nine trading areas of reasonably homogeneous peoples. And you say Europe is one, and the fact that Portugal's a third the wages no. of the Netherlands is not that No, different. I'm saying Europe is one. The United Europe is one. North and, American free right. trade. And you can, 
and you can afford the disparity between Portugal and the Netherlands. That isn't so great a gap to cause all the industries in Northern Europe to move to Portugal. No, it's not the gap so much. It's a fact the size. You can absorb 10 or 20 million people. One of the arguments, Senator, given the whole time is why can't we do to China and India and Vietnam what we did to Taiwan, to the Tigers, Taiwan, Singapore, um, uh, South, South Korea. I'll tell you why. Size. Those countries had 75 million inhabitants. And yet if you analyze the figures, Senator, you will find that we hemorrhaged enormously to make them rich. Given, given your theory, China couldn't even afford to be a free trade unit within itself with what, a billion. Why a do billion. you believe that? Hmm? Why do you believe that? Why do you really believe that everybody depends from us? No, firstly, I'm not making firstly, believe. Firstly, they are big enough and they are growing enormously and they will become a huge indigenous market. Secondly, we can go and invest there and participate and help them in their development with our technology and our capital and that will become a great big trading region and we will have helped develop them, we will have benefited from that development and we will not have bled to death, we will not have lost jobs. See, one final point I'd like to make on this is that one of the fundamental mistakes that are made by economists is that when they talk about trade, they always talk about trade in terms of money. They say, well, in the case of America, it's got the biggest trade deficits ever had, so I don't understand all these points about being more competitive than ever that were made by Ambassador Cam to Cantor, uh, because that's the way to measure it, in both in terms of, of trade and capital outflow. They're hideous, both, for both sets of figures, as you know. And look, we've got nothing to be proud of in Europe either. But the point is that the way you measure trade is not money. If we in the West export a billion dollars worth of goods, we might have employed less than a thousand people making it because the only things we can export are things which got minimal amounts of labor. But when we import a billion dollars worth of goods, completely different. The economists who only understand figures and don't understand society will tell you that trade is in balance. We've imported a billion, we've exported a billion. But the reality is we've exported jobs, products, which contain the jobs of a th perhaps a thousand people. And we've imported products which employ tens of thousands of people to produce. So if you look at a social balance of trade, what it's doing on society, on stability on our towns, on the social costs, on the budgetary costs, on how this nation feels, that balanced trade for the economy is totally destructive for your nation, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Danforth. Thank you, sir. You're very uh, good to be here Thank with us much. today. Um, you made a very powerful statement about problems that we are having right now, exporting U.S. jobs to the rest of the world. And then you concluded by saying, and therefore we should not agree to this GATT agreement, I didn't quite follow the leap there. The, I mean, most of your testimony was how terrible things are today. And then somehow it followed from there that the GATT agreement was a bad agreement. That's, that's correct. I mean, I, I believe that if you follow the GATT agreement, a free trade area with these countries, you will export jobs to such a degree that you will impoverish and destabilize the United States and that we will do the same thing in Europe. And I believe that a few corporations, why, why, why do you believe, Senator, that I, was, I, was, I flew over yesterday, and in the plane I was reading the International Herald Tribune, and there was a little article which was analyzing, it was from the New York Times, and it was analyzing, um, the day before you did yesterday's New York Times, it was analyzing who was for and who was against this GATT affair in the States. Obviously, as I was coming to visit you here today, I read it with interest. And who was for? They used the word monolithic. It was big business. Monolithic was their term. Why? This is a dream for big business. It is absolutely unlimited access to vast quantities of almost free labor. Well, and that... Could, could I just, yes. just ask you... Uh, uh, Right now, there is no limitation to the ability of U.S. businesses to locate offshore. But there is to re-import their products. If you have a situation 
in the, in the old days, when I was in business, Senator, I, I, I invested everywhere. And when I invested here, or in India, or in, in Latin America, or in other countries in Europe, I invested to serve those markets. I didn't close a factory in France, ship the work out to Vietnam, and re-import the products. If I invested in India, it wasn't to re-import the products, it was to serve and develop and conquer, in the good old-fashioned old, old sense, a market share in India. Today, that has changed. Today, because of GATT, they are moving offshore so as to get rid of your labor force because it's too expensive and so replacing it by a cheap one. Well, that's, of course, that's, that is an argument against the status quo. No, that's not an argument against what is proposed. Uh, by the way, I don't much like the status quo, but what you're doing is when the ambassador was talking about change, he was saying, let's go headlong into an accentuation, I, an aggravation, an acceleration I, I don't of the status quo. I, I, didn't, I didn't hear that. Well, that's what the way I heard, because the word change kept on coming. Well, uh, let's and talk... And somebody denied there was change. I well, think it was you, sir. Well, and I agreed with you. Can I just ask you, I mean, one of the things this does is to um, improve, change the dispute settlement procedures under GATT. Does that lead to an exporting of U.S. jobs? Senator, they're two different worlds. One of four billion people earning two or three percent of what they're earning here. But vast numbers of unemployed. And there's our world. Sir James, I, if I you know. create a global market, it is not by tinkering with the problems. Sir it James. is not by small disputes that you can bring these two worlds together overnight. Can I just say that I mean, we now have a global market? No, sir. We are moving towards one, and we should move away from one. But at the moment, we have a number of different streams of movement. We have regional markets being created, two in Latin America, one in Asia. They're all over the place being created. So our perception is that the U.S. market is much more open than most markets in the world. There are others that may be Singapore, but by and large, that the U.S. market today is more open and that there I'm are very sorry for you senator and for all americans well that is why your salaries have dropped 19.3 percent well, you are sacrificing their earnings on the altar of a false economic doctrine well i understand that that's your basic testimony and it is a criticism of the status quo that's correct but i don't think you have made the linkage between your objecting to the status quo and why you are against this agreement. Well, because right now we have essentially an open trading system as far as our country is concerned. No, and no. yet we have a situation in other countries where they have relatively high tariffs compared to ours. They have uh, all kinds of methods of keeping U.S. products out. They have widespread subsidies, especially on agriculture. Um, they have, uh, the, we have no protection for our intellectual property, and so on and so forth. And these are the specific areas that we hope to address in the GATT agreement. Senator, you go way beyond that. If you, had, if you, if you, if you go way beyond that. If you had an open market, why would you have had NAFTA? You had the same market before NAFTA. The debate on NAFTA, was that about nothing? You no, know, the debate about uh, NAFTA was exactly on this point. The debate about NAF NAFTA was a debate about the disparity between the Mexican market and the U.S. market. But what where Mexican, it, where, the Mexi it? where the Mexican tariffs, for example, were many times what ours were, where the Maquiadora program in Mexico was something unlike anything we had in this country. And what we wanted was, as everybody has talked about today, a level, level playing field. I mean, right now, U.S. manufacturers can and do uh, export jobs to other countries. They have usually said to us that there are some downsides to doing that, and that's why they haven't gone as headlong as they may have in that direction. But right now, there is no limitation on their doing it. What there are are various limitations on the U.S. being able to do business abroad, and, and we feel that we would be better off solving the problems that are at hand and the problems that are solvable. It seems to me that you're talking about a different problem. You are arguing for, uh, say, a higher tariff rate 
imposed by the United States on imports, or you are arguing for the U.S. playing the same game that's played by other countries. But the GATT agreement is basically an attempt to try to create better possibilities for us doing business abroad. Senator, it, you just mentioned, you said maquilladoras. You said that was happening in Mexico and it wasn't happening in the U.S. What does that mean? That means that people could manufacture cheap in Mexico so as to import it in the U.S. It was no more than the demonstration of everything I've been saying. Secondly, Ambassador Cantor was here, and he was talking about 40% reduction in this and 40% reduction in that. On top of that, China wasn't part of the GATT, and we have negotiations going on to bring them into GATT. And he was saying, to bring their goods in, they have to bring them in and change the label. We have all that about the labeling. You haven't got a free trade system now, but if you did, I'd say get out of it. I'd say you're committing suicide. You're bleeding to death in jobs and capital. And what I would say is, have a region. Be proud of it. Your purpose, the purpose of the economy, is to create stability, employment, prosperity, and contentment in a society. It is not to destroy that society to make GNP growth with the resultant increase in unemployment. So don't try and improve GATT. GATT is unimprovable. It is on a totally flawed economic premise. Think again. But one thing I pray you do, this is the single most important economic act the Western world has ever taken. A free market, not with Mexico and Canada, but with China, Indonesia, the world. It'll change the life of every American. Everyone. At the moment, the debate is just starting by a miracle, as it was in Europe. The single most important act which is going to change everything is going through without a debate and according to the opinion polls of the majority of the American people not even knowing what it's about. And all I pray is take the time to think about not just how to improve GATT, but whether there are alternatives to GATT which can create a better, more stable, more prosperous society in America without the problems that unfortunately you and we are living through from unemployment and destabilization in the cities and all the rest which follow on because they're all part of the same phenomenon. Sir James, I, I have overstayed my time by a lot. I, I would only say that you have made a very strong presentation for your point of view. Thank you, sir. You have not drawn the linkage between your point of view and opposition to GAP in the opinion yes, of, uh, of this Maybe we listener. can do it on some other occasion. If I haven't, I apologize. But thank, anyhow. <laughs> thank you very much for being with us. Senator Dalgan. Chairman, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. James, thank you for being here. We have not had, at least in the United States, a thoughtful, thorough, interesting discussion about trade policy and what it means to our future. We just have not had it. And I don't understand why that's the case, except maybe that um, there, there are a group of people in this country who think in a certain way about trade and who have adopted the mantra chant of free trade and you're either with them or you're some sort of isolationist, xenophobic, uh, slow thinker. Um, I mean, that's sort of the, the, the two camps that you, you're in on this. Um, Senator Danforth made the point, we can now move our production offshore. We certainly can and it's being done more and more often. That's the point. And my view of GATT is it is the same direction except going from a trot to a gallop. It's the point I was trying to make to Ambassador Cantor about the fact that I think we already have a model for the effects of where this is heading. If I blindfold myself and just listen to the words, I can't tell a bit of difference over the last decade of who's talking on trade. It all sounds the same. Same direction, same chant. Uh, the model, I think, of what this leads to is what we've seen for 60% of the American families in the last decade. The 60% of the American families with the lowest income in the last decade have not seen better times, they've seen worse times. Those 60% of the families suffer now lower income. Uh, why is that? Well, the television camera that now points into this hearing room, that, that is a technology that we in America invented Whomever is watching this is watching on a set that someone outside of America produced. Why? Were we smart enough to invent it but not produce it? No. 
It's because others in the world are willing to produce it much less expensively than we, and that expense is largely in the issue of labor costs. And so that's how I get back to the points that you made, uh, Mr. Goldsmith. I, I feel very strongly that, that there needs to be some responsibility attached to accessing established markets because established markets are built with great pain and great anguish and great society debate and on, on many issues over a long period of time. And if you say, look, they're here, they're free, access it and don't worry about responsibility, I, I think you destroy what we've built and what we have for a long while. So I, I guess what I'd like to ask you, just about t two points. Uh, in this country, and it's probably true in Europe, we are obsessed with measuring economic health by what we consume rather than what we produce. Which, which I think is, is, is folly. Ultimately, the success of our country and our, our way of life is, is gauged on what we produce. That is the source of, of long-term wealth. Do, do, you, do you have that same feeling, and how do they feel about that in the European countries? I will speak for myself rather than for everybody else, but the whole concept of gross national product, GNP, is a mistake, Senator. GNP measures activity. It does not measure beneficial or detrimental activity. To give you an idea, it has been testified in front of this committee and others that such items as cancer, drug abuse, and uh, crime hurricane. account for nearly 8% of GNP. And hurricanes. That is, that is not a good measure. And that is why you can have a growing GNP with a diminishing employment base, greater instability in the towns, and in general impoverishment of the nation. In England, over the last 30 years, the figure, figure I gave you for France was for 20, GNP went up over 90%. And according to the official statistics, the number of people who've gone into poverty have gone from four to 11 million. Now, how can you have a system which tells you on the one hand that your economy is nearly doubled and the number of poor is nearly trebled? This isn't a country of 56 million inhabitants, Senator. So what sort of nonsense is the economic theory on which we're basing ourselves? Doesn't it? When I sat down, I went to the first meeting of this, uh, I don't know if it's confidential or not, but I don't, I don't, I don't suppose it is, um, at the first meeting of the Foreign um, uh, Trade Committee in the European Parliament in Brussels the other day. And I listened to three speeches by rapporteur, I don't know if the same word here, where they were reporting on work that had been done in commission, subcommissions, and then a speech from the bench. And I took the floor after that. I said, I've been absolutely amazed. I said, every single one of these speeches has been how to accelerate imports, how to extend imports from China, how to make it more profitable for importers, why poor importers were not making enough profit. I said, now, why is it, how is it possible that at no time did this committee of parliamentarians representing supposedly Europeans, the interests of European society, why is it that at no time did you ask what are the effects on European jobs? What are the effects on European cities and their social stability? What are the effects on the budgets of European nations in terms of unemployment costs? What are the fundamental effects? You people have only talked about the P&L account, the profit and loss account of importers. I said if I'd woken up in this room, I would have thought I'd found myself in a room full of lobbyists for importers. I had indicated previously my notion of this in a rather simplistic way is that we now have in the country a growing set of international economic conglomerates. They're not interested in economic nationalism. They don't say the Pledge of Allegiance. They're interested in providing the fullest rate of return for their stockholders that is possible. And increasingly, it seems to me, GATT is a facilitator for international economic enterprises to access the lowest possible wage and to sell in the best established market. That's and I think that is a disconnection of everything that we understand that can make a market and an economy work to help all people in an economy. Is that is 100% right. I gave you those, I cited those figures earlier of transnational corporations. And I don't blame them. I was head, as I said before, of a large corporation. And as head of a large corporation, you are steward who has to try and create the ongoing life, the, the, to perpetuize that, that corporation. And if the structure is such that if you stay here, you go bankrupt, you can't take that risk. You've just got to go. And that's what these people are going to go. They're not less patriotic or more patriotic. 
It is society and its representatives who are creating a structure which forces those people to act in a way which is totally negative to the interests of society. Let me, um, if, with the indulgence of the senator from Texas, make one additional comment. I see my time has expired. Uh, I think your testimony is very persuasive and very powerful, and I, I, I hope it begins to stimulate a thoughtful discussion rather than a kind of a thoughtless uh, chanting of things here. In this country, we need a, a national discussion and debate about what this policy ought to be. Um, I would simply say that not all that is negotiated in GATT is unworthy. Uh, the, the efforts to pry open markets of industrialized countries that are now closed, like the Japanese and some others, are very worthy goals, and there are some successes in the agreement. Those I support, but I, I, I'm concerned about the direction of the philosophy here that accommodates what I think are the international economic interests at the expense of the industrialized nations, and especially at the wor of expense of the working families and the economic health of the working families of those nations. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Senator Hutchinson. Uh, I'm sorry you missed your chance there with uh, Ambassador Keller, and the record is open for any questions that you have of him, and we're glad to recognize him. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I did have to go and vote and uh, yeah. stayed on the floor a little too long and didn't get to ask my questions of Ambassador Kander, but I would like to uh, submit those for the record. Uh, my questions on GATT to Ambassador Cantor are not in your field, uh, sir. Yes. Um, yes. But uh, I did want to say that my questions were based on state sovereignty and making sure that our states do continue to have sovereignty and to determine exactly what the state sovereignty limits were, and also for the funding mechanism uh, that I do question and the issue of why we didn't use spending cuts uh, versus tax increases. I just basically don't like the idea of using tax increases to fund tax decreases. And so I do want to submit those questions to the record for Mr. Cantor. Uh, on the areas that you have uh, brought up, however, I would like to discuss some of your views. Uh, I had a very interesting visit from the CEO of the Miles Corporation. And he was talking to me about the effects of NAFTA, really in a different view from the traditional view that people have had of, of NAFTA, uh, which was the giant sucking sound. Um, he had uh, several plants in Mexico, and because of NAFTA, and because of the easing of restrictions of bringing things into the United States as well as, well as exporting from the United States, he is now moving uh, much of his Mexican operation to the United States because the efficiencies and the safety and the production are better. So that is an example, I think, of, of a different uh, experience, perhaps, than, than you have mentioned. Would you like to comment on that? So did you say the Miles Corporation? Yes. The, the pharmaceutical people? Yes. People make alka well, Yes, they do pharmaceuticals, yeah. but they also do chemical processing, and we, they were really talking about the chemical processing right. part of their operation. Well, this might be one of the exceptional areas where you have very, very little employment, because in the pharmaceutical section, I, we used to be in that business, you employ very small numbers of people, so that might be possible. But um, to suggest that factories are coming back here as a whole, um, as you know, the official first eight months of 1994, um, there have been 224 factories moved from the U.S. to Mexico. So, um, and that wasn't a bad period because Mexico had been going through a tough time and it was pre-electoral with all the pre-electoral problems. So I think if you look at the overall figures, but just but forget me, the examples. Let me just ask you, though, if you would put this in the context of GATT, because I, I think that when you're talking about movement of jobs out of America, uh, the points that he was making, I think, were interesting right. uh, from the standpoint of the competitiveness, which does e expand right. if on, you on, have on the level just, I may just comment on, finish on NAFTA. On NAFTA, it was a close call because they are neighbors new one stability, and they're relatively small. It is exactly the equivalent to us of Eastern Europe, if you like, which we're going to have to handle in a different way than if we'd handle Indonesia, Bangladesh, and India, and China. Therefore, it's a different problem, a difficult problem has to be handled, 
but part of the cost is moving out. Now, the idea that um, <coughs> one of the fascinating things that we found, and there had been a study, there was a Senate study in France done this by a senator called Senator Arthur, but one of the things that we found was that the new factories, the new plants and equipment, in those countries where factories had left France to go and get things manufactured, were more modern than the factories they'd left, because they were new. And therefore, not only did they have cheaper labor, but they actually had state-of-the-art equipment over there. Um, and those, the people that were working there have a level of productivity which is enormous. Firstly, the idea, obviously they're skilled people. Obviously they want to work and need to work. Obviously they haven't been touched by the facilities that we've had in terms of the things which we consider civilized and normal, and probably rightly so, all the various social advantages that we have. So these people are working hard, they're skilled, they've got good equipment, they've got the capital, the amount of capital. You mentioned, the chairman mentioned Felix Roatin, but I read in yesterday's paper that he was forecasting a $300 billion a year would have to go out and direct investments per annum in the short-term future to developed countries. So it's a real hemorrhage of jobs and people. All that capital will be building new plants. So the idea, just in common sense, the idea that a factory with new equipment, new plant, new technology, all the capital, and paying 42% or 3% of our costs in terms of labor, could not compete with us, is, is just not logical. It's, it's obvious. I mean, in other words, if we took every economist out of this debate and just brought normal people in and said, well, how can you compete with the same, to make the same product under those circumstances with people paying 95% less wages and they're skilled people? Well, it's well, obvious that they must succeed. Let me just ask you this question. One of the things that hasn't been mentioned today is, is really we've talked about lower wages but we haven't talked about the lower prices that should result from all of the things that are happening. I mean, are we taking away more subsidies? Are we uh, taking away the added costs that uh, tariffs provide? So if you do, in fact, have lower salaries, could it be that we are offsetting with lower prices and basically disinflating the world economy? Senator, that's an excellent way. I'm delighted you asked that question because the ambassador brought up this question, he called it the greatest tax reduction in history, I think were his words. And then he talked about 36 billion for the United States. <laughs> and the chairman pointed out that it wasn't at all a tax reduction, it was a reduction in the cost of imported goods. And that consumers would benefit where the prices of goods were reduced, and there were examples given where they hadn't been, where profit margins had increased, but on the whole, it will reduce prices. Now, I want you to bear this in mind. A consumer is not just a consumer. A consumer is a person who works, earns his or her living, pays taxes, lives in a town as a city dweller. And if you create a situation where you've exported jobs on the scale that we have in Europe because of free trade, what will happen? She'll lose her job. If she keeps her job, she's going to pay higher taxes and she's a city dweller, and she's going to live in even greater disorder. And therefore, if you balance the cost, because it means nothing for nothing, the indirect cost with the facts that you can buy from goods cheaper, you're buying the goods cheaper at the risk of your job, the stability of your home, the safety of your neighborhood, and the level of your taxation for social welfare. I, I see your point, but I would just say that if you do take uh, the subsidies and the tariffs out and, and all of that sort of in between that's not very productive, uh, then perhaps you are also lowering the number of bureaucrats, lowering the cost of government, lowering the cost of, of money, and therefore perhaps your taxes go down, uh, perhaps your whole uh, cost of living goes down. Uh, I mean, could you... Senator, yes, you could get into a deflationary situation, but what you are doing is, as you said, you're lowering the number of bureaucrats, you're lowering the number of employees, you're lowering the number of people working in factories. What are you increasing? You're increasing the number of unemployed 
and the social instability that creates and the social costs and welfare costs that creates. You cannot just take the accounts by taking in the good without taking in the consequences. Well, let me just end by saying uh, I know my time is up and I understand your point and I think it's a very good one. I would just say that I think we have to put into the equation here competition and secondly, an overall problem that we haven't had a chance to talk about today, and that is, in the world sense, is technology going to lower the number of jobs anyway? No matter what we did, uh, would just the fact that we have so much better technology uh, take away jobs that are not replaceable? And if so, what are we going to do about that? That is, uh, Senator, that is, you see, you're right. Technology is also a problem. But it's not because you've got pneumonia, you've got to get cancer as well. And <laughs> what you're doing, that you've got one problem, don't add another. It makes it all the more important. And if we uh, don't improve our health care system, people will die and that will solve the problem. But I hope that's not the overall solution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator Hutchinson. Uh, so, James, let me put these facts... Uh, because I've just checked them out, and they keep bringing up NAFTA, and we'll have a hearing perhaps on NAFTA. I'd like to, because the facts are categorical. One, there have been 224 applications at our Department of Labor from industries. We put in a program, don't worry, if you lose your job, we're going to give you economic assistance. And as a result, there have been already 224, representing over 30,000 jobs, gone down. So I said, well, I know everybody throws this thousand, that thousand, let's be more specific. And in a specific sense, electric machinery, sound, and TV equipment is minus 671 million, this trade effort, since the enactment of NAFTA, the first five months of November, since the NAFTA enactment, the U.S. ran the following trade deficits with Mexico electric machinery, sound equipment, 127% increase of the deficit over the same period in 1993. Optic, photo, medical, and surgical equipment, minus 241 million, and 87% increase of the deficit over the same period in 1993. Vehicles and parts, minus 218 million, a 30% increase of the deficit over the same period in 1993. There's been a sharp drop in net in exports from Mexico since NAFTA was enacted. So I agree with you, NAFTA is peanuts compared to this world trade agreement here, uh, bringing in China, India, and the entire Pacific Rim, which is incidentally the growth area, which is incidentally going to add the two billion customers coming under capitalism. So that's where the real opportunity is, and that's where the real challenge is, and we have got totally different economic systems and can't even seem to understand it. And when you raise the question, as I have, the lack of understanding goes right to the political or the parochial. USA Today asked me to write a column, I wrote a script, but above it they had a much twice as long a column, and it was headlined, South Carolina Senator stops NAFTA for uh, local political uh, benefit. Now, I have to say it, I hope it'll benefit us if we can stop it because I think it's economic suicide and I know we're going to lose a million textile jobs and a lot of them are going to be gone from South Carolina. And that's the mindset now. These senators think they're so sophisticated in technology and don't understand the new world. Back in 1961 under President Kennedy, in order to have the President act under the national security provisions for trade, you had to have an official finding that the particular article was important to our national security. And at that time, we got the witnesses. Uh, it wasn't Secretary Russ, we had State Department, but he had George Ball representing him, which you know. Uh, we had the Secretary of Treasury, Dillon, Secretary of Labor, Goldberg, Secretary of Commerce, uh, Hodges, uh, and the Secretary of Agriculture, Orville Freeman. And after a series of hearings, the finding was, and it's on the official record, and that's how President Kennedy could act, 
the textiles was the second most important to our national security. You see, again, these people think in terms of money. And they don't think in terms of jobs. And they don't think in terms of important jobs. We can't send them down to Haiti in Japanese uniforms. And incidentally, they say, well, the Japan, Japan's are, they're not out of textiles. They finance everything, as you know, in Thailand and down in Indonesia, and they're all Japanese factors. They've got not only the textiles, but all the rest of sophisticated electronics, high-tech computers. And we'll be making airplanes in 10 years, and so will China. It's hard to get through with the pejorative and the categorical labeling and everything else when you're thinking of the world, particularly the free world, the industrial free world, that's brought and preserved freedom, capitalism, the spread of capitalism. I'm trying to do the same thing. I'm working for the Boeing aircraft worker out in Seattle just as hard as I am for the textile worker in Greenville, South Carolina. I think, uh, and I really do appreciate your having stated that you wouldn't they are presumed to come to the United States and tell us anything about trade or anything else were it not for us in this soup together. There isn't any question about it. And they don't seem to understand that. I like the emphasis, and I think we're going to have to really embellish that, about the economists do not understand society and the cost to our society. We, uh, we've been tied up here for three months this summer on a crime bill. What are the thing causes the crime bill? Exactly like you said, you don't fault the corporate chief executive. Our policy forces him to go. I've been chastised in the Fortune 500 because I found in that book, The Work of Nations, if you got the book by Bob Reich, I had to go on a program with him. And I found on page 95 that the Fortune 500 had not created a single net new job in a 15 year period. I thereupon got the Fortune article just recently that said that we, for the first six months, and that's the most recent figure of last year, they shipped out 225,000 jobs. I've got the 50 billion investment offshore. And what's causing it? We are. This is the policy that we have here. And what is the real result? It's not high tech wages, low wages, or whatever it is. It's a crime in the inner city. When I debated NAFTA, there are 97,000 garment workers in the Bowery, downtown New York. Those garment worker jobs are gone. Just a few years, they'll all go 58 cents an hour in Mexico, no clean air, clean water, and all those other requirements as they do in New York. If they want to know they're going to get crime in Watts in Los Angeles, 67,000 garment. That's going to Mexico. I'm losing 40,000. So they're, not, they're looking like they're smart and they want to show that they're intelligent and up and ahead of the curve when they're so far behind the curve on the general duty. The corporate executive doesn't owe me a duty. Uh, he owes the stockholders a duty to make a profit. But I owe a duty overall to watch my country and learn from experience. And no one's been in the business about attracting industry and jobs longer, 40 years, easy and longer. So I've been working at it, seeing it, and understanding. Jim Fallows gave me authority uh, yesterday, gave me credibility yesterday, because he'd written that book, Looking at the Sun. He studied it for 10 years over in the Pacific. You give me character and credibility because you know how to make money. They say, Harling's a right heck, he's a politician, he's a textual fellow, he's just trying to get at the mill shift and get the gig vote, and he couldn't care less. Uh, you know how to make money, but you know how to stabilize and save a society in this free world. And I'm not going to get engaged in questions. I got a bunch of things, incidentally, I want your little booklet that we had printed to be entered in its entirety in the record, Global Free Trade in GATT by Sir James Goldsmith. It'll be included in the record. And thank you, thank you, thank you. It's, it's been dynamic. It's, it's been very, very forceful. And maybe we can come again because I want to bait them. I hope they ask, well, I didn't get a chance to question because I know you're willing to come again or whatever it is and have in this series of hearings an educational process. You can see right now 
Uh, I, I was just astounded when the distinguished senator from uh, uh, Oregon, he said, uh, uh, look, I always thought reducing employment was a success. Uh, and now to look on it not as a step of progress. And the other uh, uh, senator uh, from West Virginia said, well, you know, Japan's lost jobs too. Why are we worried? And then the ambassador Canada said, well, yes, on the tuna dolphin case, uh, we're going to lose $250,000, but what's $250,000 in this trillion dollar economy? We're not trying to save dollars, we're trying to save dolphins. We're not trying to save dollars, we're trying to save jobs. That's the whole point you're making, and thereby save our free world economy and the strength thereof. Thank you very, very much. The committee will be in recess subject to call the chair.